Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara's May Community Forum. What's up with the Plains Oil Pipeline? I'm Gail Sharenko. I'm a member of the board of the Santa Barbara League of Women Voters. This forum is being sponsored by the League's Sustainable Communities Committee. And I'd like to introduce briefly Sandra, uh, Sandy Grasso Boyd, who maybe if you just stand up and wave, they'll know she's the chair of our Sustainable Communities Committee. It's also being co-sponsored by the Santa Barbara Community Action Network, as we can, and we have Nadja Abushana. Did I do okay? Yes. Um, and I'm not sure who all is here from the Gaviota Coast Conservancy, other than our speaker, Anna Citron. Um, they will have some materials in the back, I hope, uh, after the film and, uh, and after the whole program. Um, so th those are the co-sponsors. Um, and, and there are representatives of the groups who are going to be happy to talk to you about what else they do, because they do a lot for us. I wanted to thank Direct Relief for the use of this beautiful room and this wonderful facility. Uh, I guess you saw the Ukrainian flag as you drove into the parking lot. Direct, Direct Relief is sending a lot to uh, Ukraine now and the areas around. Um, they've been operating something like 60 years in our community. And this facility, which opened about five years ago, um, is run by solar power, and it's the only uh, grid network operated off of solar power, I think, in the country. Anyway, it's the first. So we're in a very state-of-the-art environmentally sound facility. Has anybody here not taken a tour of the building and wants to take a tour after this um, event? Good. We have, we have enough people and I will let them know after I start the movie that they, so they can line up somebody to show you this amazing facility. Some of us have done that before. Um, so we really appreciate this amazing room and their technical help with our audiovisual setup. Before we start the film, I would like to acknowledge that we stand on others' land, which our predecessors took or stole or otherwise obtained. The Shumash people have cared for this land for many years. And we are now becoming more aware of how to care for this land. We realize that we can learn from them for our mutual future. So we thank them for continuing to work with us in our shared community. The film we're about to see begins on May 19, 2015, the day of the oil spill at Refugio. This Friday will mark the 8th anniversary of that spill. The film premiered at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival in 2018, so this forum is being held in memory of that fateful day. The film is 56 minutes long, so we'll take a brief, brief nature break after the film before introducing the panel that will follow. Welcome again. Uh, to our panel discussion, what's up with the Plains Pipeline? I, I want to celebrate, or not celebrate, but I want to mark the 8th anniversary by making the film available for free. So if you watch for the notices from your various organizations, uh, we'll put the link up for being able to see the film um, maybe for the next week. Um, before I hide it in password protected again. It's my privilege to introduce Claire Van Vlerica, who will moderate our panel today. She has worked as a high school science teacher, 
the Natural History Museum docent, administrator for a local senior citizen charity, civil service commissioner, member of the Santa Barbara School Board, as a representative to the Santa Barbara County Library Advisory Committee, she served on the boards of several nonprofit organizations, including the Santa Barbara Education Foundation and Postpartum Support International. Claire is on the steering committee of the local AAUW, American Association of University Women. She's a League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara board member and often moderates our candidate forums. And we're really pleased that she's willing to do that, and she will introduce our panelists. Thank you very much. This is a bit of a change for me. The majority of the things that I moderate are candidate forums, uh, so this is going to be a slightly different forum. We will be, I think, very uh, pleased to see what our panelists have to say today. I'm going to introduce each of them first with a brief bio, and then begin to pose the questions that the league has put together. And anything that we don't cover, please do put it on your note cards, and we will try to get to as many of those questions as we can. First, Linda Kropp is the Chief Counsel at the Environmental Defense Center, a public interest environmental law firm headquartered in Santa Barbara. Linda has served as an attorney at the EDC since 1989. Most of her career has been focused on fighting offshore oil development, preserving open spaces, and protecting wildlife. As you saw in the film, Linda and the staff at EDC were involved in the response to the 2015 Plains Pipeline spill and have been working since then to protect the coast from another disastrous event. Anna Citrin is a local environmental and land use attorney with the Law Office of Mark Chigillo and principal attorney for the Gabbiota Coast Conservancy. Anna earned a BS in biology and a BA in philosophy from UCSB and a JD from UC Law of San Francisco, formerly UC Hastings. Advancing the GCC's mission of permanently protecting the environmental integrity and rural character of the Gaviota Coast has consistently been a major focus of Anna's practice. Her work for GCC involves a mix of land use advocacy, policy development, and collaborative engagement with landowners and government agencies. John Zorovich, is currently Deputy Director for the Energy, Minerals, and Compliance Division for Santa Barbara County Planning and Development Department. He has worked for the County of Santa Barbara for nearly 30 years and graduated from UCSB in Environmental Studies. So, thank you all for being here. We do want to let you know that we also invited a representative from Exxon, but they were unable to attend. But they have sent a brief statement which we will read to you, or I will read to you. A representative from Pacific Pipeline Company will not be able to attend the League of Women Voters event on May 16th. As you may be aware, our applications for multiple permits with respect to owner operator transfer, installation of safety valves to meet state regulations, and a pipeline replacement are at different stages of the review process with the County of Santa Barbara. Since appellants for a number of these applications are a part of your panel, we do not believe it would be appropriate to participate at this time. That was sent by Steve Green of Exxon. Well, panelists, welcome and thank you for being here. Um, because our time is relatively short, we would ask that you please keep your answers as succinct as possible so that we have time for all questions that the League has prepared and also some time for audience questions. I would also say that even though the questions in many cases will be directed to one of you in particular, if others of you have something to weigh in on that particular topic, please do let me know, and that's fine. As I say, it's not a candidate debate. It doesn't matter if one of you takes one minute and the other takes three, it's fine. All right. <laughs> the first question is directed to Linda and Anna. It's been eight years since the pipeline spill. Can you give some perspective on the impact of the spill, both on the environment and on the community? And Linda, do you want to begin? Unfortunately, you only have two microphones between the three of you, but I think you can manage. Just push the little thing up. So this goes green. Is that working? It's working. Fantastic. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. Um, and thank you, Gail, for keeping this event alive. 
in our discussions and in our memories and because we're still dealing with these uh, similar threats. So um, in terms of you know, what has happened since the spill, I think probably in terms of impacts on the environment, one of the most important um, consequences is that seven platforms were shut down. They could not transport their oil and four are now permanently shut down. The three point Arguello platforms off of Point Conception and Platform Holly offshore at Elwood and UCSB, and those platforms will be decommissioned. So that's a big change. The other thing uh, that has happened is that for the other three platforms, which are owned by ExxonMobil and sit offshore the Gavi of the Coast, are proposed for restart. And as you may know, ExxonMobil uh, applied to the county for approval to truck the oil because there is no pipeline available and several folks and groups in this um, room um, opposed that including um, EDC represented Get Oil Out and SB Can and Anna represented Gaviota Coast Conservancy and there was a whole host of other organizations involved as well and convinced the county to deny that application because of the risks of accidents and spills. Exxon then sued the county and we are engaged in litigation and we have a hearing scheduled um, for June 16th in federal district court. The other thing I wanted to mention that passed that happened since the oil spill that was referenced in the movie is we do have some new state laws. Um, we may have some new federal regulations as well dealing with pipeline safety but um, this particular pipeline has now been transferred from federal authority to state authority because it only transports oil if it is replaced or revived uh, within the state. So state regulations and laws are stricter than federal. And so if there is a new pipeline or if there's an attempt to restart the pipeline, it would be subject to stricter laws, including three laws that were passed directly as a result of this pipeline spill. Laws passed by then Senator Hannah Jackson and then Assembly Member Doss Williams uh, required uh, better safety designs for pipelines, more frequent inspections, and better oil spill response. That being said, we know we still can't prevent another spill. And so that's why we need to really remain diligent to prevent any you know, additional um, offshore oil and gas development or onshore for that matter. We have the same risks onshore. So, um, some things have changed, but and things remain the same. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you to the league for, for having me. Um, so thank you, Linda, for the comprehensive um, update on what's changed. Just a couple of things I would add um, with respect to the pipeline specifically. Um, the pipeline is sold from Plains to Exxon and Exxon is now newly remotivated to um, transport their oil by any means necessary. Um, and what we've seen is a, a, a change in um, approach uh, from pursuing the replacement of this pipeline um, to a, uh, a restart of the pipeline uh, using these new safety valves that they proposed. Um, and I know we'll be talking more about that. Um, finally, I would just say, you know, I think the, since this bill, the community has really um, come together, uh, has been reminded of the devastating consequences that oil spills have on our uh, coastal environments. And, um, and that energy uh, will hopefully carry us through these, these hearings, these important hearings that are coming up. Um, at the county, both on the uh, uh, Exxon's appeal of the valve replacement and also the, uh, the change in ownership. Thank you. Our next question is for John. Uh, we understand that there are three applications that have been or are before the County Planning and Development Department. Could you briefly outline each of these applications and their current status? The applications were originally filed by Plains Pipeline Company, but now appear to be pursued by Pacific <coughs> Pipeline Corporation. It would be helpful if you could clarify who or what company currently owns the pipeline and what their relationship is to ExxonMobil. 
Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks first for um, inviting me here. I think this is a this is a wonderful event, so I appreciate the invitation. Um, let me start with we have three applications. One is uh, Exxon's proposed purchase purchase of the plane's pipeline. So I think for all intents and purposes, Exxon now owns that mine, but we have a ordinance in the county, Chapter 25B, which requires us to go through a process to evaluate the change of owner, operator, and guarantor. And so we're staff is currently processing that application. Um, the application was originally submitted last fall. Uh, our, just, our director made the decision back in March um, which made the findings for various categories that we need to evaluate. Are they in compliance with conditions? Have they submitted a current safety audit to the new owner? Have they paid their fees? Um, there's about five or six different things that we had to go through to evaluate that. That appeal, that was the decision of the director was appealed. Um, and so now we've scheduled a hearing uh, before the County Planning Commission on June 14th. Interestingly enough, just last week, late last week, Exxon submitted their applications. This get, it gets a little weak, so I'll just touch on it. They said, originally submitted for a temporary owner operator, temporary operator. They've now revoked or requested to retract that application, and now they've submitted applications for permanent owner operator and carried forward which is what we're going to carry as an entire bundle before the planning commission coming up. So the owner operator, I guess you could say is probably Exxon, but the county still needs to complete its process for acknowledging that change. So we consider it still pending. Um, another application we have is the request by, I'll call it Exxon for now, um, to install 16 valves into the pipeline purpose of the valves are there to kind of put the pipeline in segments. So if there is an incident, then the pipeline, rather than have the... Just hold it close. Yeah. Here? Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Much better. Sorry about that. Make sure you're going. There you go. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, so that application was originally approved by the county zoning administrator. The application was appealed by three applicants, appellants, and that appeal was considered uh, back in March, and then the planning commission asked us to come back to return for additional information, and at the last hearing on April 26th, the planning commission um, denied the request to install those valves into, in the pipeline. And that was something that was alluded to by Linda um, plans in order to keep that line operational, at least in the mines from a regulatory standpoint, they need to come up with best achievable technology. That was something that Supervisor Williams had discussed in the, in the film. And so their attempt at meeting that, they, they proposed those valves. Um, it was reviewed by the Office of the State Fire Marshal. They considered it that met that requirement. <clears throat> so then they submitted the application to the county. And, it, and largely, that was their effort to meet one of the requirements of AB 864. So again, that decision is now going to go before the Planning Commission in June. And then the other change we have, application, is a request to build, construct an entire new pipeline. Um, that request has been ongoing for several years. Um, last year, we're currently preparing the environmental impact report and environmental impact statement. It's an EIR and EIS because the pipeline traverses both state, local, and federal lands. Um, last year, <clears throat> staff identified that there's additional information needed to prepare the EIR and EIS with respect to some biological resources. So we asked. Exxon plans to provide that information. Um, some of those surveys need to be done in a timely way. We, we want them done during the spring when they're most noticeable rather than going out in the dry season. So they've been preparing to work on those. Um, I would anticipate that we would receive that information um, very soon, next couple of weeks. 
and then we could begin finalizing the, the EIR, but we meant finalizing, finalizing the draft EIR. So that draft EIR, once it's finalized or complete, it would be set out for public review. So the project for a new pipeline is still being processed, but I think because we had to wait for some information with biological resources, um, that's kind of held up that process for almost 10 months. Uh, actually, in your answer to secure the first couple of questions, you have overcome some of the other questions, so I will skip ahead a little bit here. Um, to all of the panelists, what are the pros and cons of this battle installation proposal? Uh, Linda, let's start with you and just come on down the line. I don't know what to on that. She was looking on that. Okay. <laughs> sure, I, I, can, I can start. Um, so on its face, the installation of, of safety valves sounds like a good thing. Um, and I guess the one, the one pro is if they were installed and there were another spill, it would reduce the overall quantity of oil that could escape into the environment. Um, but on the con side, what it does not do is anything to remedy the external corrosion, which as you saw in the film, um, was the cause of the Rebugio oil spill. Um, and so installation of the safety valves on this corroded pipeline would allow for it to be used again. Um, Exxon does have to apply to the state fire marshal um, to get approval for restart. They need a waiver um, for um, effective cathodic protection, which is the, the, the process that protects the pipeline from external corrosion. It's obviously not effective, um, so they'd be pursuing a waiver. Um, and then operating the pipeline, if it's approved, if restart is approved with increased monitoring and inspection, which we saw fail rather spectacularly last time. So um, we are very um, concerned that any effort to reuse um, restart operations using the pipeline that's now in the ground will um, cause an unacceptable risk to the environment um, from an additional rupture. So even if the quantity that escapes is smaller, many ruptures could occur, and that is the concern and the significant downside of this safety valve project. I would just like to add that um, you know we we never expected that this pipeline would ever be reused. Um, you can see how corroded it is. It's not like a normal pipeline spill where. And maybe there's you know an you know, external rupture of the pipeline like happened down in Huntington Beach, or when we had a spill from a pipeline um, from Platform Irene, it was um, one weld malfunction. But this is the entire pipeline is corroded because of the design. It's a heated pipeline and it wasn't insulated properly. So we never expected this to happen. In the original federal investigation and corrective action order. Plains was required to you know, review, investigate the entire pipeline, remediate, meaning fix um, you know, any problems on the pipeline. When the pipeline was transferred um, to the state's authority, there was a consent decree in, in the litigation, and that went away. So now the remediation is only tied to potential restart. So we have this damaged pipeline sitting out there. It, they still haven't completed the investigation of the entire line. There's issues with access to part of the pipeline. So, um, you know, I agree with what Anna is saying is, you know, we need to make sure that this pipeline is, you know, abandoned, whether that means rip it out or, you know, whatever the best uh, mode is. Um, and so that's you know, the concern that she was mentioning about installing, why would you install valves on this pipeline? Thank you, John, do you want to weigh in on this question too? Um, sure, I don't really don't have much more to add at least 
what they what they spoke about. Clearly, the advantage would be you have an H pipeline, so adding additional safety features is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Um, but again, in the last hearing, the planning commission they did make findings to deny the project, and their concern was, as both of them alluded to, you know, it's an H pipeline, and it's you know, it's conditioned. They had concerns with it, and you know, installing the valves would extend the life of, a, of an existing age facility. So that would be fun. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Lee. We understand that the County Planning Commission rejected the application to install additional safety valves, as you had mentioned, John, on the order pipelines 901 and 903. If the pipeline company obtained approval to install the valves and then were able to repair the existing pipeline, would any environmental review be required before they restarted it? And if they pursued building a new pipeline, would a full environmental review be required for approval? I think the basic question here is, you know, would there be any differences in the type of environmental review required for restarting versus new pipeline? So, for the installation, the proposed installation of new valves, staff did do some environmental review. They proposed a, what we call an addendum to the original EIR, which updated it based on impacts associated with installation of the valves. If that project were to be approved, then they install the valves, um, unless Exxon had some other change, which I don't know about at this time, there would be no need for additional environmental review after the installation of the valves by Kennedy. For the new project, it's, it's much different. It's a brand new application, a brand new pipeline, and so we're starting the environmental review process from the very beginning with the preparation of a, an environmental impact report and an environmental impact statement, and that would have to go through the entire environmental review process. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, you know, the the valve replacement or valve upgrade project um, we see very much as a way um, that Exxon sought to avoid um, additional environmental review. Um, they tried to mask the project as only the installation of valves, that's all the county decision makers need to, needed to look at, um, while really ignoring the many changes in circumstances um, regarding the pipeline that have occurred since the EIR was certified for that pipeline in 1986. Um, so, the replacement project is undergoing robust environmental review at the county, and I would anticipate that there would be significant unavoidable environmental impacts identified, uh, which the county board of supervisors would then have to override in finding that there are you know, significant benefits to the community um, from approving the project. And um, in this day and age, it may be difficult to make those findings. So um, the valve upgrade project is really an end run environmental review um, and uh, an effort to get oil moving um, without the appropriate uh, environmental review and oversight of the county. Linda, did you want to weigh in on this? What she said. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this last question is actually for all of you. With restarting the old pipeline, or starting a new pipeline be consistent with the goals of any of Santa Barbara's other long-range planning efforts, such as the Climate Action Plan? Let's start with Linda. <laughs> well, our clients uh, get oil out as we can in the Environmental Defense Center oppose restarting the platforms because of our concerns about climate change. Um, and it's not just looking at the platforms, you have to look at the whole project. So it's, you know, re resuming production at the three platforms, which emit a lot of air pollution and greenhouse gases. It's operating the processing plant um, in Las Flores Canyon on the Gaviota Coast, which prior to the shutdown was the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the county. 
and then it's the refining the oil, and then ultimately it's the consuming the oil and the gas. And so you have to look at all of that together. And in this day and age, um, we need to be moving away from fossil fuel production and use. Um, for the county itself, just looking at its own inventory of greenhouse gas emissions, this would be a huge impediment. Um, so we are supporting clean energy options of solar, we're working on offshore wind, um, obviously conservation and energy efficiency. Um, we're making some progress, but there's a lot more that can be done. Um, but we need to really be fully committed to the Climate Action Plan and a carbon-free future. I don't know that any, I have anything to add. I would just say that um, I, I would say inconsistent, in my opinion. John? So I think the last time I looked at the climate action plan, obviously just by its, its title, right? It, it, it guides us to go more towards the green environment away from petroleum, oil and gas, and look to other other options, other other ways to create energy for us. So I think by its title, there would be a conflict with, with continuing oil and gas development. That said, I don't recall, and I could be incorrect here, but I just don't recall of there being specific policies in the Climate Action Plan that stated, you know, stop oil and gas development. I don't, I don't recall that, so I don't know if there would be a, a direct inconsistency with such and such specific stated goal or policy of the Climate Action Plan, unless that's just what I'm not recalling. So, while we definitely want to move in that direction, I don't think there's anything right now in the existing plan that would say this is in direct conflict with specific goals or policies. But obviously, in the long-term vision, we would want to get away from continuing reliance on oil and gas and move towards other energy options. Thank you all. Uh, that actually concludes the league's questions. Uh, I have several questions from the audience. If there are any more, please get them up to me. Let's take about a two-minute break. That's about all it's going to take for me to make sure I read through these and can read everybody's handwriting. Okay. We will uh, write. The first question is basically a question of mechanics. Briefly, how would the proposed new so-called safety valves function in an existing faulty pipeline or in any other pipeline where they're where they're done? Yes. What, what is the the mechanics of these proposed valves? So the, the request is for 16 valves. I believe most of them are motor operated valves. And so they would be operated in a way that needs electrical power and they are able to turn off from some remote control center or whatever and, and, and automatically close off the pipeline, but they need an electrical source to do that. There's several other valves, block valves, that don't need the electrical power, but they just, they go with the direction of the flow of whatever is in the pipeline, and when that flow is, if there's a, a, a lack of pressure somewhere and the flow wants to go in the opposite direction, they just, they, they block the flow, they prevent the flow of whatever's in the pipeline of oil from going the opposite direction. So there's two kinds. Of, one is, is, is operated with electrical power, and one doesn't need to have that, but they are both designed to stop, you know, flow in the opposite direction so that it isolates sections of the pipeline and lessens the size of the... So. And which kind are the uh, current proposals regarding? So the current proposal includes a mix of those. I think of the 16 valves, I believe 11 are motor operated and 16 are check valves. Next question. Someone says, I was jogging at the Oso Flaco last week, uh, tar balls all over the beach, et cetera, et cetera. Is this the same oil that spilled 
over Gambia in 2015. And the uh, second part of the question, would more oil rig drilling reduce the natural spills of the tar from the bottom of the ocean? Uh, Anna, you want to take that? I can answer the second part of that question. I also want to mention on the valves, besides having valves in place, the other question is, how are they operated? And what happened with the plane spill is, when that pipeline was originally permitted by the county, the county required an automatic shutoff system. So if that pressure reduced because oil is leaking out of the pipeline, so it's reducing the pressure of the flow, then the entire pipeline system would automatically shut down. As was mentioned in the film, the developer at the time sued the county and that wasn't required, and so that's why it was being operated by folks in Houston, and even though they saw the loss in pressure, they did not shut down the entire pipeline system, and that's why, even though there were some valves, that's why so much oil spilled. Um, since then, the county does require these automatic shutoff systems on new pipelines, but, so it's, you need to, you need to look at the whole system. Um, but the second part of that question was about would drilling reduce natural seepage. And the geologists that we have consulted with say no. Um, and it's, I'll give a simplistic um, explanation because I'm not a geologist. Basically, the drilling occurs in very deep reserves, um, you know, hundreds if not thousands of feet deep. And there's many you know, layers of geology above that. The natural seepage basically occurs in the very shallow strata. Um, there's, you know, pockets of methane that can pop up out of the various fractures. Um, so that's the, the simple uh, geology explanation. But it, also, if you look at what has happened, um, for example, we were told um, when the drilling stopped at the Elwood Piers, when there was a spill there, in 1994, we were told that if Venico wasn't allowed to restart that drilling, we'd see a whole bunch more natural seepage, and in fact, that was gonna to have to go on for a long time. Well, the wells were never allowed to be operated. They're gone, the whole pier is gone, and there was absolutely no increase in natural seepage there. Okay, thank you. Um, this question says, Exxon may have at least 10 years more oil to produce from their three platforms. Are we being envious to continue driving gas-fueled cars while saying no to producing oil here? No. I would say no. Um, when, when the pipeline was approved back in the 80s and when the offshore oil platforms were constructed 40 plus years ago, um, they were not intended to be used for this long. Um, they uh, passed their useful life, in our opinion, um, and GCC uh, strongly supports the decommissioning of all of this infrastructure. Anyone else want to add something to that? And there is a lot that we are doing. You know, groups like Environmental Defense Center and other organizations um, working on these issues. We are supporting the local electrification reach codes and community choice energy and supporting a lot of state bills about renewable energy and electric vehicle requirements and so there's a lot we can do that we are doing um, to help with this transition thank you thank you uh, last question we're running close on time here uh, i suppose this would be again to all three of you do you have any guess on how the Board of Supervisors is likely to respond to the valve appeal? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I think if you track some of the Board of Supervisors, there's those under North Kennedy that may be more friendly in, in, uh, in, in voting positive for oil, oil and gas projects in South County, it may be the difference. So it could be a, a typical North-South County voting split. 
Um, I guess I, that's, yeah. I don't want to say any more than that. What? Do either the other of you have a add on that? I would just weigh in briefly. You know, what, what we saw at the Planning Commission is that they, um, the commissioners really wanted to understand the purpose of this project, what its ramifications would be, how it related to the process going on at the Office of the State Fire Marshal for restart and operations. And they were unwilling to accept Exxon's um, narrow view uh, of the project. Um, I, I think with the record that was established before the Planning Commission, the excellent findings for denial, that the commission made, I think that gives a roadmap to the Board of Supervisors um, to, uh, to make a similar determination. Um, and we're, we're hopeful that, um, that they will um, reject uh, Exxon's appeal. So thank you for coming, thank you for participating, and I assume you might be willing to stay and mingle a bit if anybody has another question that you'd like to ask any of them individually. So this wraps up our I was almost good to say I'm going to say